Ethiopia. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris wraps up Ghana visits promising over $1 billion to women entrepreneurship across Africa. Also coming up tonight, mental health care advocates lord Parliament for decriminalizing attempted suicide. Also tonight, electricity company ramps up debt recovery, clamming down on communities two weeks into the exercise. Later in business tonight, the parent company of Zenith Bank Ghana sets aside $267 million to cover losses incurred from the domestic debt exchange program. On the international front, artificial intelligence key figures want training of powerful AI systems to be suspended amid fears of a threat to humanity. We've got details of all these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. You can join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Feel free to visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Share your comments and we promise to share them with the rest of the world. The news now in detail, and the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has promised over $1 billion to women entrepreneurship across Africa. The pledge will also include another $60 million in the Women in Digital Fund. On the final day of her Ghana tour, Kamala Harris had a mid-afternoon roundtable discussion with seven women entrepreneurs. Kamala who had delivered a resounding speech about women empowerment the day before at the Black Star Square, spoke about harnessing their potential in business without barriers. The 49th Vice President of the United States noted that countries greatly benefit if women are supported to lead and thrive. The economic empowerment of women relates directly to the ability of that person to engage in innovation in a way that makes real, the aspirations, the vision, and the dream that she naturally has. And of course, there's a direct correlation between policies that are directed at the economic empowerment of women and the general prosperity of societies. She indicated that the U.S. government is set to invest billions of dollars as part of efforts to lift the economic status of women on the African continent. Digital services are essential to 21st century economies. Yet, there is a gender divide in the world. So today, to help address this, I am pleased to announce here with these leaders that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, together with our administration, will establish the Women in the Digital Economy Fund, which is a $60 million global fund in total these investments represent more than $1 billion that is being dedicated to advance women's economic participation across the African continent. Some participants at the roundtable discussion shared their thoughts on the intervention. I think this is something that women across the continent and even in the world have been um, advocating for ever since, which is women should be able to take up leadership roles, to be given the opportunity. But we will need people to help us to make laws to be able to um, also impact the laws. So it, it's a course in the right direction. Her visit was timely. Uh, we are in a time where the digital economy is booming and there's this new trend on the use of AI and uh, digital tools. So knowing that she's passionate about it and willing to invest in this sector, and especially in women-led uh, startups, that is a good one. Africa is battling with a lot of uh, unemployment issues and it has been uh, ascertained that entrepreneurship is one of the ways that we can fight the unemployment issues on our continent. So if there's opportunities that she's bringing is going to be able to tackle this aspect. For me, I think her speech was on point. The U.S. Embassy is set to hold engagements across the country in support of women entrepreneurs. 
Let's go over to Zoom and speak to Michael Nketiah. He is an international relations analyst. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. It's been three days of meetings and pledges from the U.S. Vice President. What should be the takeaways from the visits of Kamala Harris? Uh, good evening to your viewers. First, I believe that this visit by the U.S. Vice President is a reaffirmation of America's commitment in, to the African continent. Um, since 20, 2009, there has been a deliberate American, uh, foreign policy by successive American governments towards Africa. And the message is simple. America has seen the emergence and dominance of countries like China, of Russia, of Turkey, of India on the African continent. And as America works so hard to see, to, to, to protect and withhold its dominance and global superpower, particularly for the African continent, it seeks to neutralize the threats posed by these countries on the continent. And by so doing, by visiting countries like Ghana, Tanzania, and Zambia, it, it shows that America is still committed to the African cause. And they are well determined to partner leaders with regards to ensuring the improvement of America's foreign policy. Again, we must put on record that this is a new direction being set by, the, by a new direction for America's foreign policy. We are not hearing much about security cooperation. We are talking much more about women empowerment, the economic empowerment of women, women in technological and digital innovations, we heard the vice president talk about investments in climate resilient and risk infrastructure. All these are broader scopes and new dimensions that America wants to pursue as a new foreign policy approach with regards to the African continent. And we should also be mindful of the fact that it cannot be a coincidence that in a week that Russian President Vladimir Putin decided to write off over $20 billion worth of debts to Russia by all of, of, of African countries. And in the week where Ghana's finance minister traveled to Beijing to go and negotiate our debt restructuring agreements with his Chinese counterparts, we had the US vice president also visiting the African continent and making series of promises, even promising a resident economic advisor to help the government of Ghana in, in, in addressing its current economic challenges. All these points to a particular direction. It tells us that America is very much concerned about protecting its global supremacy. And even if it would see some of its powers to emerging powers like China and Russia or even Turkey, it will not go down without a fight. We are very much determined to protect their interests on the African continent. Now, Michael, we've had visits of former presidents like Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Barack Obama. Do you think these visits have made enough impact on Ghana-U.S. relations? Well, from, from very reliable sources, I'm well informed that um, the visit of Vice President Kamala Harris is supposed to prepare the way for a major visit that will be embarked on by President Joe Biden in the latter part of the year, hopefully in December. And it, it is set to usher in a new Af uh, for American foreign policy for the African continent. And I believe that previous administrations, we saw the visits of Bill Clinton, we saw Barack Obama, and we also saw George Bush. Unfortunately, that we've lost Michael in Ketia, but he is an international relations analyst. Wrapping up the tour of U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to Ghana, she's also expected to visit other African countries. All right, Portia, let's do some other stories now and to the House of Parliament where the decision to decriminalize attempted suicide has been hailed as a major victory for mental health care in Ghana by advocates and mental health professionals. Now, Parliament voted on Tuesday to amend the law in a move that has been universally welcomed. My colleague Judith Awatritando has more. It passed almost unnoticed on Tuesday. But as news emerged that attempted suicide will no longer be treated as a crime, the general reaction has been one of relief. It will now mean that people can talk openly about what is going on in their mind and seek help. That is Dr. Osei. 
the immediate past president of the Mental Health Authority. He was a big advocate for the law to be repealed. What it meant when the suicide or attempted suicide was a criminal conduct was that if anybody had an issue um, of thoughts or contemplating suicide, he would keep it to himself because he knows that I might be jailed. So he'll not seek out for help. The latest available data in Ghana on suicide dates back to four years ago and says there's a suicide mortality rate of 6.6%. In simple terms, close to seven people out of every 100,000 people die from suicide. And out of the lot, more deaths are recorded in males than in females. Between the year 2020 and 2021, attempted suicide cases increased from 777 to 902, with persons between the ages of 16 and 35 years, the prime of the country's youth, the most affected. The Mental Health Authority blames relationship breakups, graduate unemployment and financial distress as the leading causes, but advocates have been bothered for years about the lack of proper care and preventive measures for those dealing with mental health problems. Kobe Blay is a psychiatric nurse. If you attempt suicide and you do not, you are not successful, you could be arrested. So very often Anyone who is attempting will make sure that they fully complete it. And that is where it's very important to provide an avenue where anybody who feels um, the need to die by suicide will rather be given an opportunity or be given the necessary help. Section 57.1 of Ghana's Criminal Code says, a person who attempts to commit suicide commits a misdemeanor. Indeed, there's evidence of persons being fined and in some cases jailed for attempted suicide. Why must you have a system that is so complicated that people with even mental health disorders cannot be catered for under our system? And, and that has been the status of our laws until recently. So what that meant was that if you were having some depressions and you want to, uh, you, you feel like dying, what we are saying is that make sure you die. Because if you don't die, we will definitely come after you and we are going to prosecute you. The law, which has been in force since 1960, is strongly associated with increased national suicide rates as in other countries with similar laws. But advocates insist persons with suicidal tendencies must rather be given mental health support. MP for Medina Francis Xavier Susu is one of them. There are several researches uh, published even by the Ghana Mental Health Authority that shows that people who attempt suicide are people that have mental disorders. Because for a person to come to the decision to take his or her own life, most of them may be suffering from some extreme depression or some form of disorder. And so when those people are caught in the act, what they need is medical care and not imprisonment. With the latest amendment, it would now be considered a mental health issue requiring assistance by law rather than a criminal offence. Advocates are convinced this will result in a drop in suicide cases. At the end of the day, I expect that the incidence of people wanting to take their lives will go down. To ensure that the law works though, a lot more attention needs to be paid to the quality of mental health care according to the Mental Health Authority. Judith Awuchitando, TV3 News, Accra. In more news tonight, hundreds of homes have been disconnected over illegal connection by the National Revenue Mobilization Tax Force of the Electricity Company of Ghana. According to ECG, residents have deliberately bypassed installed meters to consume power without paying. The electricity company extended its clamp down to Pambros in the Wager municipality of the Great Accra region. It was easy to find households engaged in illegal connections. For the power distributor, it was time to fish out residents who had deliberately bypassed the installed meters to consume power for free and to deal with the issue of community hostilities on the back of attacks on some task force members in Accra, the team was accompanied to the area by armed policemen. On our revenue mobilization exercise, we came across this community last week and 
um, we discovered that a lot of the households have bypassed the meters that have been installed. So there are a lot of illegal connections and so we are here to um, disconnect them and rectify some of the situations. The errant residents will be cut off from the national grid and not even these explanations by some corporates were enough to convince the team. <laughs> The meters that they brought to us, when it rained, it rust. And the distance to the vending point is also too far. Sometimes you go to the vending point and they will tell you the network is down. The illegal worries a lot, and when the light goes off, no one comes to our aid. When you go to the ECG outlets, no one listens to us, so people find their ways. The electricity company of Ghana has vowed to go hard on persons who engage in power theft and diversion of power lines to avoid paying requisite bills. And no matter who may be affected, the task force says it would go all out to recover the 5.7 billion CDs debt during the month-long exercise. Your neighbor may just be next. Imano Samani, TV3 News, Wager, Accra. In some politics, businessman Enes Kobia has withdrawn from the National Democratic Congress flag bearer race to back former President John Mahama. The remaining three aspirants have been cleared to contest the party's May 13 presidential primaries after selecting positions on the ballot. Kojo Bonsu took his turn at the vetting committee on Wednesday. I was asked about the economy, our social democratic party tenants, and um, how I would rule Ghana. My tenor in office in Kumasi. It's not easy to go through such a vetting, and I think I, I'm so confident and I trust myself that um, I'm qualified to become one of the people to lead in this. It was then the turn of Ernest Kobia to complete his vetting after he met the committee on Tuesday and was asked to bring other documents. But the businessman appeared not interested in the contest anymore. He had brought a handwritten letter to the committee informing the panel of his decision to withdraw from the race. It's not I'm pulled out. I give you my support to JM. And it's a good decision for our lovely party to move further for future. We are not wasting anybody's time. And it's the best decision I took for the party. The vetting committee led by a former Speaker of Parliament, Edward Do Ajaho, said the committee did not in any way intimidate the businessman. This is the statement, and he said that it's voluntarily given. When he brought it, because of the question you've asked, we ask that he should indicate that it's a voluntary decision and not that he was intimidated. And he did that. And we call it Jorat in it is here. That is a voluntary decision of his. Because we suspect that somebody might think in that direction. If I should go further, his letter says he has got withdrawn to support JDM to win and save this country. The three aspirants have thereby been cleared to contest the flag bearer race after balloting for positions by their representatives. John Mahama will be number one, Kojo Bonsu number two, and Dr. Kwabina Dufour number three. All of them did well before us, and uh, they all satisfied the conditions. If you look at the NDC guidelines, you have one, you must satisfy the qualification and eligibility as prescribed in the 1992 constitution. You have to satisfy the party constitution and you must also satisfy the guidelines issued by the National Executive Committee of the party. According to Edward Do Ajaho, the elections committee is to take over with other activities in the run-up to the party's May 13 primary. Evelyn Tengma, TV3 News, Accra.
Let's now go to Parliament, where the second Deputy Speaker of Parliament has directed the Education Committee to investigate the University of Ghana's willful disregard of a court order to reinstate students of the Commonwealth Hall after they were dismissed, contributing to a statement by Bulsa South MP, Dr. Clementa Park. The MPs were unanimous in their condemnation of the university, whose council is headed by a former Chief Justice. The management of the University of Ghana have refused to act in accordance with the dictates of the order. The police and other allied security personnel have been employed by the management of the University of Ghana to frustrate the efforts being made by the students to call attention to the management of the university to obey the order of the court and to reinstate them. It's for an institution like the of Ghana to disregard a court order. It is something that this house must take it seriously and we must act as soon as possible. We should not allow institutions like the of Ghana to disregard the laws, to disobey our, our, our court orders. It cannot be. And we will therefore call on everybody here to support the call made by my senior brother, um, Honorable Park and Roxanne, Mr. Speaker, Commonwealth Court produce the best gentlemen, produce the good husbands, produce the bold men, and produce a lot of leaders like my colleague said. And in the chamber, if you take the census and tie people here to hold in all the universities in this country, you won't go beyond Commonwealth Court as number one. That has the number of people in this chamber. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot to be learned from Commonwealth Court. And I think that the University of Ghana should obey the laws of this country and obey the court order and bring back the students. I think I would urge, I will refer this statement to the Committee of Education to ask them to engage the university and to report back to us why the university authorities, headed by the immediate part Chief Justice, she is the chairman of the university council. So we expect that she would ensure that the law and order, respect for the courts, uh, the sanctity of the court orders are respected. So I direct that the statement be referred to the Committee on Education to engage the investor authorities. Elsewhere, a former majority chief whip is incensed about the entrenched positions MPs take in the sessions they take on the floor of parliament that do not reflect the will and dictates of the constituents they represent. Now, eulogizing the former old TAFO MP and former Minister for Monitoring and Evaluation, Dr. Anthony Akotose Muntaka Mubarak says the conduct, if not halted, will cripple the current parliament. We are taking too much and 10 positions. Both sides. Those in government taking so much in 10 positions. Those in opposition taking extreme and term position. And I can bet you this is not helpful, it's not helpful to our country. It is not helpful to the development of parliament. The better both sides begin to think that there is a national interest above the MPP interest and above the NDC interest will be sinking our country. Let's go to the Ashanti region where the completion time for the second phase of the KGTR market redevelopment may suffer a setback following the suspension of work at the project site. Over 400 on-site workers have been laid off and more expected to be retrenched by April 3, as sources have revealed. Traders at the race course market who were evicted from the old central market to pave way for the construction of the new market have described the current situation as troubling. The project site is quiet with no sight of construction activity going on currently. Work on this 10,000 capacity market stalled since December 2022 due to delay in release of funds to contractors. At 65% complete, the second phase of the KJTR market redevelopment may likely not meet the contractual timeline set for the project. Combined Kumasi Central Market Traders Union is demanding answers over the halt of work. Do we as stakeholders not deserve to be told? Do we not deserve to get an explanation for why the market has been halted? 
are we to sit aloof and watch as things happen? Because we have examples. We have seen the Crowfro market coming to a standstill for years. Are we to sit down and watch as the Kumasi Central Market also comes to a standstill? Our big question is, why is there a halt in the construction of the market? The traders have warned they may be forced to hit the streets should government refuse to release money meant for the project. We do not want to organize demonstrations, but if we do not hear from the people who should be responsible for this as soon as possible, then we have done it before. We can do it again. We are going to organize series upon series of demonstrations to send our grievances to the government. If that is what they want to see, then we will get that done. The 248 million euro project is expected to be completed in June 2024. Its completion will boost economic activities in Kumasi and beyond. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 News, Kumasi. In other news tonight, Transport Minister Kweku Foresiama has asked transport operators to support the National Road Safety Authority and its plans to ban commercial minibuses from long-distance journeys. The minister who gave an indication he wasn't aware of the directive eventually gave up in requesting media support. After two separate accidents in the eastern region involving three minibuses claimed 17 lives, the National Road Safety Authority reiterated its intention to restrict commercial minibuses from intra-city services or routes exceeding 40 kilometers. The authority on September 16 last year issued a final caution to transport operators to caution drivers following complaints of excessive speeding and reckless driving by minibus drivers on the highways. The plans by the authority has not gone down well with the operators. They jumped the gang by saying all these words. Road safety started this thing, not today. Even the state itself now is using these Toyota buses for long distances, like Accra to Aplawu, Accra to Kumasi. They are using it because it's luxurious and it's durable and it's strong too as well. So them climbing down on those vehicles, to me, it is not the best. The sector minister at a media briefing appeared to have no idea about the plans by the authority. National Road Safety Authority to ban. They say, you say you are going to ban what? We need a radius of about 40 kilometers. Okay. But the, per the law, do you have the power to do that? Yes, under the law. The new, the new ally. Yes, okay. That is good. And I, I think that we are developing this country together. And if it is that we need to take certain measures to protect our people. I need the support of the media in the course of this thing too, for you to support them. I'm sure people will come out, they will complain. But if it is that that's the decision we need to take to protect lives, I think that you should let's support them when they, they try to institute such regulation. From road transport to water transport, and the sector minister, Kweko Forisiema, says the Ghana Maritime Authority and the Ghana Navy must be held liable for lapses in water transport in the country. The minister was responding to questions on passenger safety on water transport at a media briefing in Accra. The Ghana Maritime Authority, in conjunction with the Navy, are the ones who are responsible for the safety on the water lake. And at times, some of these things do happen. So the last time that this thing happened, I think that I called a meeting between the two agencies that they need to, um, uh, to make sure that at least they increase their, their patrol system on the, on the lake because at times they close, and when they close, some of these canoe, traditional canoe operators don't follow the rules or the, they don't, they don't uh, at my information, that they don't operate 24 hours. So I've told them that if possible, they can do a 24-hour 24, 24 operation. The Navy is asking me to buy them an additional uh, speedboat so that they can do But you, you will see. It's unfortunate, and I'm sure, that going forward, they will take cognizance of the lapses in terms of what is happening to make sure that they fill in. A reminder of so watching News 360. This is our major news bulletin for the day. Still ahead in the bulletin. 
We've got the very latest in sports and also business news. And Ella Michelle is already standing here for the latest in the world of business. And Ella, you know how parents support their children. Indeed. And in the case of Zenith Bank, what's happening? Well, <laughs> now that we are getting the, the news that their parent company mm. is supporting them, then we know that some of the orphanage banks that we've been yeah. raising concerns mm. about, well, it looks like they it would was... also have to get their parents oh, involved. You go ahead. <laughs> and the parent company of Zenith Bank Ghana has set aside $267 million to cover the steep loss it suffered from the domestic debt exchange program and this is according to the Bloomberg news agency Zenith Bank is the latest to receive support from a mother bank to account for holdings in government bonds my colleague Sani Abdurrahman has more according to Nigeria based Zenith Bank PLC which runs Zenith Bank Ghana the domestic debt restructuring resulted in considerable losses to its operations in Ghana Assets of the bank impaired increased by some $130 million from 2021, which is quite huge. Not just Zenit Bank, uh, financial institutions across board are still counting their losses from the government debt exchange, which got them to swap their bonds that paid an average of 19%, with notes returning a little over 8%. Zenit Bank Nigeria is the latest to set aside funds to recapitalize its Ghanaian operations after some of Africa's big lenders voted nearly $500 million to cover losses incurred by their Ghanaian units due to the debt exchange. The banks covered included Stambik, First National Bank, Absa, Stanchard, among others. Quite some good news because it will strengthen the capital positions of these banks, but bad news for shareholders. Continuously, the foreign banks are receiving support from their mother companies. The big question, however, is the fate of the indigenous banks who are yet to announce the extent of impact the debt exchange on their operations. More worrying is the situation of some banks that were already in distressed position even before the debt exchange. A big question asked by my colleague Sani Abdurrahman. Obviously, three business will bring you the response to that. But away from that, investor interest in Treasury bills declined last week as the government missed its auction target by nearly 24%. Some analysts fear the government could gain miss its reduced target of 1.3 billion cities for this week, following an increase in the policy rate from 28% to 29.5%. Speaking to three business market analysts, Kojolecha said the latest development would make Treasury bills less attractive. It's highly likely that government may miss the target. Now, they may meet the target if they pop up the rates. That is if, because um, with regards to T-bills, it's, it's still competitive in the bidding amongst the banks. So if the banks come with their rates and um, the, the government still picks it up, it, it will then draw up the weighted average rate. So it, it depends on what will happen. The banks go with their rates, okay. and if the government decides that it can take it, it can accommodate it, why not? If not, and it gets turned down, these excess funds are all going to OMO, which, I mean, it, it makes sense. FD rates are going to be in competition with T-bills in the sense that, obviously, the bank, when they get the money, they can invest at a higher yield. Mm -hmm. So they'll prop up the uh, um, um, FD rate. So if if um, if the government is giving you let's say eighteen point nine percent for a ninety one day T bill, the bank can offer say twenty one percent for a ninety one day investment. They pick the client's money and go and invest it at um, a yield of twenty eight percent on the OMO market. Director of Financial Marketing at the Bank of Ghana, Stephen Opata, has reaffirmed the Gold for Oil program has contributed to almost 50% drop in ex-pump prices. This follows earlier remarks by Vice President Dr. Mohamed Obamia that the Gold for Oil program will ultimately lessen the burden of consumers at the pumps. Speaking in an interview, Stephen Opata said the drop in prices of petroleum products could be attributed to government's Gold for Oil program. 
The projection by the Institute of Energy Security comes up following the relative stability of the local city against the U.S. dollar, coupled with the price declines of oil on the international market. The second pricing window for March 2023 offered some respites to consumers on the domestic fuel market as prices of fuel dropped for the second time in a row. In the second pricing window, the price per litre for petrol stood at 12 cities 85 pesos, diesel at 13 cities 39 pesos, and LPG at about 15 cities per kilogram. The Bank of Ghana has reiterated one of the major contributory factors for the price drop in X pump price is government's goal for oil program. Stephen Opata is the Director of Financial Marketing at the Bank of Ghana. Part of it really has to do with the goal for oil program because um, we are able to, uh, it's created a lot of competition in that sector and that is also impacting on price. But more, more importantly, we are able to use this facility to procure uh, oil at competitive prices, which we are translating to the export prices. Okay, so I think that what, what I want to share here is that, yes, export prices have dropped, and a big factor to this is not only uh, international oil prices. Well, that's some good news for consumers that will be monitoring that. MTN, in partnership with the Communications and Digitalization Ministry, is to construct the first ICT hub in Ghana. The project, which starts in three months, is aimed at training the youth and giving upcoming entrepreneurs opportunities to expand their businesses. $25 million has been allocated for the project. The construction of the facility is part of a broader plan called the Ghana Innovation Hub with three pillars, namely the Accra Innovation City Project, the Ghana ICT Hub, and the Ghana Education Platform Project. The hub will be a place where entrepreneurs and as well as the youth can come and do a number of things. ICT skills training and we're seeking to have a center that can support in-person ICT skills development. We see this as a gap amongst the youth and an important area for our competitiveness as a country going into the future. The Minister for Communication and Digitalization Esla Ousre Kufu is optimistic the hub will complement government digitalization drive. It will create jobs, it will help us deal with unemployment, it will enable our young people to acquire the necessary digital skills that they need, it will grow more startups in this space, and even the startups can be incubated and grown into larger companies that we are referring to as unicorns. The hub will train 200,000 youth with ICT and digital skills and generates more than 100,000 jobs within the first three years after completion. For more in the world of business, log on to 3news.com. My name is Adela Michelle. Sports News is after this break. Stay with us. Good evening and you're welcome to the entertainment news segment here on News 360. My name is Noella. Now for our first story, Ghanaian dancehall sensation Stoneboy has unveiled the track list and cover art for his upcoming album. Now the album titled Fifth Dimension is his fifth studio album and is set to arrive on April 28 on all digital streaming platforms. The 17 track album features artists including Stormzy on Life and Money as the album's lead single Angelique Kijo, Shaggy, Davido, amongst others. Now, this album comes in three years after Stoneboy dropped his last studio album, Anloga. We're definitely looking forward to that. But still on our VGMA on song artist interviews, we have one now from a Galamsey worker to a security man, fast rising dance artist, Chaka Hatsinato. Now a promising music talent, the Accra fan Fula Kuna has earned a lot of street credibility with his energetic stagecraft. Earning a nod as a VGMA on song nominee, Chaka shared his experience with three entertainment. Oh, I want check. One, two, one, two. 
you know, I had no choice way back then. After school, you know, I had no father. I was staying only with my mom. So, as me being the leader, like, you know, I have to, you know, do something to survive. I have little kids, sisters at home to, to help, you know. So, I have to find any ways and means to, you know, feed the family. Are you scared? Scared, eh? Ghana, ha. On my way, no, Charlie. Soldier, you for move hard. I mean, tell me a bit about choosing music. How did you get into that conclusion? Okay, uh, from the security side, uh, the, that time we were doing that security jobs, I went to stay in a, a shy man. A, a shy man for <laughs> Charlie. So, uh, and I, I used to perform on karaoke sections and one guy walked to me and told me say hey Charlie start up doing your own thing I I believe in you say you can do it and do it better so I put down pen and before I realized Chaka is doing massively well a lot of street credibility mm. people even have comparisons that mm. you know you and Shatawale you know I'm sure you've heard those comparisons that they have done but what do you think about it we learn from the best to understand and the streets got the best so if if i'll say i'll say to everyone out there sure, even if you are that i be you have to bump onto the street learn something from there and me you know people comparing me to shatter actually when you be when you be papa into me found compare penny you but like you're saying people compare me to shatter stone boy some even say it's a culture then me is I'm doing something very well. So, you know, it just say, you know, blessings. That's all I can say. Definitely you have a few words to say to the people that, you know, helped you to get to this point. I mean, especially with the VGME and Sang, what do you have for them? VGME, VGME, and most especially my label, Hits Music, you know. Oh!